Hello, my name is Kelly Caldwell and I'm the lead instructor at Stanley Community College's Instructor Training Center. This is going to be a lecture on one of the many modules in the different courses inside of Cisco Networking Academy. I'm going to cover many different items in these particular lectures, uh, starting with CCNA, going possibly all the way through DevNet. But to begin with, one of the things I want you to know is I'm, I go with a good enough philosophy, and that is no lecture is perfect. So in other words, if you're in the classroom with me, uh, we could be interrupted by a person knocking on the door, you know, my phone could ding, your phone could ding. I'm not going to have perfect lectures and therefore my recorded lectures will not be perfect. You may hear my phone ding, you may hear a phone call start during one of the, the lectures and I'll pause the lecture and then start back over. I'm trying to give you a good enough lecture to help you learn the materials. I also want you to know if you are not taking classes at a Cisco Academy, in other words, you're watching these videos on my YouTube channel and you're not trying to participate in an actual Cisco Academy, I strongly recommend that you go to www.netacad.com, scroll all the way to the bottom to where it says Find an Academy. I'm going to put in here uh, the state uh, city that we are in, so um, in case I am in Albemarle, NC, North Carolina, as you can probably tell by my accent, but you'll see here Stanley Community College, and if you click here, you would get the information on what courses we offer and how to get in contact with us and how to actually see our offering. So if you are in an area and you would like to find your local school or Cisco Networking Academy, then go to netacad.com, scroll to the bottom and do find an academy. I strongly recommend that you get involved in the Cisco Networking Academy because it is a wonderful, wonderful program. Last but not least, enjoy, learn and grow. So enjoy these lectures, learn from them, grow, if you want to grow in the IT field, that's excellent. Or if you just want to learn new things, that's even better too. We hope these lectures will be useful for you and that you will be able to use them to increase your knowledge in the IT field. Hello and welcome to a lecture on Module 6 of Introduction to Networks version 7.2. We're going to continue on with our discussion of the data link layer. In particular, we're going to look at the data link layer and what is available data link layer there was stuck. Uh, the purpose of the data link layer, looking at it for framing and other items that are access control that are, take place at the layer two of the OSI model. We're gonna look at some of the different media access control methods and look at some of the characteristics of a data link <clears throat> frame, which is the protocol data unit for the data link layer. So what is the purpose of the data link layer? Well, the main purpose is framing encapsulating into layer two technology. So we'll learn about layer two protocols such as HDLC, PPP, frame relay, ethernet. All of those are layer two technologies and the data link layer is responsible for taking the information that comes down from the upper layers and packaging it into a frame that then can be placed onto the physical media or medium. And to do that, we will also see that the data link layer deals with the access methods that are needed to get onto a particular media or medium. And there are a couple we'll talk about that are some are contention based, some are contentionless. We've discussed that a little bit in module uh, five. So here we see a layer two header being placed onto a uh, layer three uh, set of information. So in other words, when we look at remember our encapsulation process, we take the information at layer seven, put a layer seven header on it, pass it down put a layer six header on it, and then the application information becomes the data all the way down. And then once we're at the data link layer, you've got your source and destination IP addresses, which are your layer three headers. And there's a lot more information in that layer three header, as we will see once we get down into later modules like module 11. But we then add a layer two header. Now for the layer two header, there's gonna be a destination address and a source address. And you'll learn, especially in ethernet, that we put the destination address first. And that is because each device, when an ethernet frame comes in, has to look at that frame and say, is that my MAC address? And what we're gonna talk about with that, is we're gonna talk about what MAC addresses are in just a moment. But the data link layer is made up of two main sublayers. It's the logical link control sublayer, which provides an interface between the network layer, which is predominantly software components. For instance, have you ever touched or held an IP address? The answer is probably no, because you can't. It's a software component. It's a logical address. 
However, you have held a network interface card or you may have held a network interface card. So you can literally hold a network interface card, which is a data link layer component. So there has to be a layer that bridges the gap between the hardware portion of the data link layer, which is the MAC sublayer, and the software portions of the upper layers, and that is called the logical link sublayer. So it is the layer that can be rewritten depending upon what's the upper layer you need to have the frame going to, be it layer three, of IPv4, IPv6, or other protocols that were used in the past, even though we don't use those anymore. The other items down here at the MAC sublayer, we'll learn about Ethernet 802.3, which is the IEEE standard for uh, Ethernet, uh, 802.11, which is our wireless LAN standards for Ethernet, and then wireless PANs, 802.15, which is uh, items such as Bluetooth, RFIDs that give you a wireless personal area network. But each one of these, and the great um, idea is they're modular, so you can run Ethernet, you can have an LLC sublayer that talks to IPv4, you can run wireless Ethernet and have a LLC layer that talks to IPv6. So you can have easy and seamless integration across your layer two protocols using this modular nature of the OSI model. So one of the things we have to do is we have to have a way to provide access to the media or media. Now, in the old days, um, everything was not just Ethernet, but everything was actually what we called um, a bus network. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull up my whiteboard and I'm going to draw you a bus network. So in the old days, we had a bus network. It was literally physically a bus. You'd have a terminator on this end. Over here, you'd have another terminator. And then you would have PCs sitting here like this. And again, I'm not a great artist, so you just have to deal with the, the lack of art here. Here's another PC. And then we'll just do four PCs on here so it won't be so tedious to watch me draw. All right? So we have PC A here, PC B, PC C, and PC D. So in the old days, we had a true bus network. And what would happen is when A would create a frame, it would have in that frame, obviously there was a header. And on that frame header, there would be two portions. There would be on the one side, you'd have your destination MAC address. So DST MAC, and I'll talk about what a MAC is here in just a minute. So you have your destination MAC address and you would have your source MAC address, which would obviously be the MAC address of A itself. So let's imagine, and by the way, a MAC address is a 24-bit address. So MAC addresses, uh, excuse me, a 48-bit addresses, uh, which are 24 bits are the organizational unique identifier. And then there are 24 bits in the MAC address that are the serial number. Okay. And that makes up the 48-bit MAC address. So you will see when we look at the, the headers that these are 48-bit sized um, sections inside the header. But what happened? Let's imagine that A was sending something to C. So the destination MAC address would be CMAC or the MAC address of C, and the source MAC would be AMAC, okay? Now, what would happen is A would send that out on the wire. And when it did, it would literally send it out and it would come out here and it would go both ways. Okay, so go out this way. And at the terminator, it would get actually just be uh, reduced or actually turned into to heat what it was and it would go away. Uh, very minimal heat, but it would because you can't create or, or destroy matter. But as this would come by, B would pull a frame off, would pull the frame off and look at it and say, is that my MAC address? B would say, no, that is not my MAC address. So it would then discard that frame. It would keep going along here or come over here to C. C would pull it off and say, oh, that is my MAC address. At that point, it would go through and run. There's a CRC on the end of the frame. It would run the cyclical redundancy check, make sure the frame wasn't damaged in transit. And then it would pass it up to layer three and would say, is that, look at the source or destination IP address and say, is that my IP address? If yes, it would continue to work on the frame. But that frame would also continue to keep going out here, just like this, all the way to the end, so that every device, when it would get this frame, would have to look at it at least to layer two. Now, in order to control and to stop collisions, what we had to do 
is we had to have a way or an access method so that when A wanted to send to C, D wasn't trying to send to B. And so we used what is called carrier sense. Oops, let me change that. It thought I was making a C, my handwriting, or I know my handwriting is bad. Carrier sense, multiple access with collision avoidance. And what would happen is before A would send this frame, it would listen to the wire, carrier sense. It would say, is the wire open? If it was and available, it would send. Now, the bad news is the same thing could happen. C and D could listen to the wire and nothing be on it, and they could send it at the same time as A, and you can end up with a collision taking place right here or anywhere, okay? So there was a collision avoidance method. And what happens with a collision is you usually typically end up with a frame that's less than 64 bytes, um, which is why it's called a flunt. And that frame then causes each device or the first device to see it to send out what's called a jam packet that tells everybody to wait a random amount of time before trying to resend. So you, this is carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance. So that, excuse me, collision detection, not avoidance, detection. Collision avoidance is only used on wireless networks. So this is collision detection. So A is sending to C, it listens. If the wire is available, it will then send. It could happen there could be a collision. If that happened, then the first one to see it, the collision detection mechanism would send out a jam packet to everybody saying, do not resend uh, anything until a random amount of time has expired. Now you would want a random amount of time because if it was 10 seconds, then you would just continually have collisions taking place. This is a contention-based access method because you can have collisions with CSMA CD, all right? It can happen. This is also why when you hear about our, our limits, we used to have the limits on the amount of uh, distance you could run a, a cat, uh, an RG58 cable. It's actually 185 feet. That was because the idea was that when A listened, as long as this cable was no more than 185 feet, if there was a, a signal on the wire, A would see it within its timing mechanism and that would help with the collision uh, collisions not taking place. But this is what we mean when we talk about an access method. It's a way of getting on to the media itself. That is a primary function of layer two of the OSI model. So standards uh, for layer two are usually created by IEEE, ITU. The ones we're gonna talk about will be uh, IEEE's 8023. So here's our physical topology again, and that's one of the things I was talking about. Here's the physical topology, whereas the logical topology may be like this. Back on our old picture here, what we do now, by the way, we still have bus networks per se, it, but here's what we do. We have a switch sitting in the middle here, okay? So here's a switch, and we connect our PCs off of this switch. Now, the good news is because we have switching mechanisms, we really don't run a true full bus network anymore, but this is logically a star, but excuse me, physically a star, okay? But logically it's a bus because it's still using the bus framework. We even in the old days had this thing called a hub and uh, you'll see it sometimes shown like this in the curriculum. And a hub is just a layer one component. Well, with this, it truly physically looks like a star, okay? So you agree with me, this is a star topology without doubt. But because all that a hub is, is literally a physical connection for the devices, even though it's log uh, physically a star logically, this is really just a bus with four PCs hanging off of it, all right? Because a hub, has no intelligence. It does have sometimes the ability, a hub can sometimes be a repeater, but a hub, by the way, is a layer one device. It's a layer one device. Sometimes it does have repeater functionality, which means it basically just increases signal strength, but it, it can be a powered repeater. But you know, here we have logically, this is most definitely a logical star. It's a logical star, but physically, excuse me, God, I keep messing that up, my fault, folks. This is most definitely a physical star, but it is a logical bus, okay? 
because of the way the data moves. All right. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about different topologies. So just because you have one physical topology does not mean that is the same logical topology on the network. So here are some WAN topologies that are pretty common, point to point. By the way, you'll learn about certain point to point topologies and their um, layer two header information. You'll notice if it's a point to point protocol like PPP or even HDLC that can be used point to point, you really don't need addressing at layer two because it's designed to be point to point. So if you leave this interface on the left, it's going to the whoever's on the right. Here's a hub and spoke. Okay. And then this is, I jokingly call this the satanic uh, topology because it looks like a pentagram, but this is what's called a mesh. And the big thing about a mesh is it's highly available, but it's very costly because you have to pay for all these additional links. But depending on your network and what you need, that may be what you do to ensure 100% availability and uptime. So again, point to point, here's our land topologies, our physical topologies, the star topology, the extended star, which would be two switches connected by an extended home, what we call home run, and then a bus topology, a true bus, which is what I drew for you earlier today. And then rings are something we had back in the days of token ring, uh, which is no longer with us mainly because uh, it was a proprietary protocol that was supported by um, IBM, and they never let people make generic versions of their devices. And it was a, uh, it made it a, a more expensive type of uh, technology versus just plain Ethernet. Now, the one thing we do have is two concepts in at layer two called half and full duplex communication. Half duplex, you'll notice they've got a hub in here because in half duplex you can only send or receive. You cannot do both at the same time. So in other words, there's just one set of communication channels that has to be used for both. If you ever watch the Discovery Channel and you hear uh, Base Camp to Camp 2 OVA, uh, you know, it's a British guy down on, uh, on Everest talking to the camps up on the top of Everest. Um, he always says over because walkie talkies are half duplex communication. You cannot talk at the same time. Full duplex, there's a communication channel dedicated to sending and a channel dedicated to receiving. So you see this, that's how our modern switch networks are. And in fact, what you're gonna learn as we move forward is that you really cannot have collisions on a properly created modern network because the switch with its buffers and this full duplex communication is gonna ensure you don't have collisions. So here we have a contention-based access control method, which I mentioned before, CSMACD. So the PC on the left would look to see if the media, the shared media was available. If it was, it would send. It is possible that both PCs could look and see the, the wire was open at the same time and send and have a collision, in which case a jam signal would be sent. That's the collision detection mechanism. And then all devices would wait a random amount of time before trying to resend. That is what is used on our legacy bus topology Ethernet LANs. And it's really still used on all Ethernet LANs. It's just we don't have to worry about it when we have full duplex and switches to handle um, buffering of our communications. <clears throat> Controlled access. Now, these are also what I call contentionless. Token ring is like the equivalent of the old um, Lord of the Flies book, where if you had the conch and you were in the meeting, you could talk. Well, in a token ring network in legacy ArcNet, if you had the token, you could talk, you could send information. If you didn't have the token, you had to wait until the token was free and you could get it. So the good, the big thing here is with token ring and with controlled access, since there were no collisions, it was actually much more efficient than legacy ethernet. The thing was though, is legacy ethernet even would retransmissions because of collisions it just kept, the speed kept getting faster, 10 megabit, 100 megabit, gigabit. Then we had switching. It quickly outpaced the four 16 megabit per second token ring. And it was faster and cheaper. And when it became faster and cheaper, token ring went by the wayside. If you ever worked on token ring networks, they were not easy to work on by, by any stretch of the imagination. Last but not least, we have a contention-based method called CSMA, uh, CA. Okay, that's CD, here's CA. CSMACA is used by wireless LANs, and that's where 
the device that's about to send signals its intent to send. So in other words, it says, okay, I'm gonna send something. Um, so everybody, I'm gonna send it. The access point then says, okay, everybody wait, PCB is sending or PCC is sending. It will then send and then the channel is freed. So with collision avoidance, it's possible that we won't have a collision. Um, the other thing though is you could still have collisions or actually have overlapping signals, but if that happens, then it's just gonna to try to retransmit using uh, retransmission methods that are, are well known in, in wireless methods. <clears throat> so let's look at the data link frame. Now there's a header, data link header, there's a data and that data is all the information from the upper layers. And there's what we call our trailer or our CRC. So here you'll see in the header, there's a frame start sequence. And that's a series of bits depending upon um, the protocol in use. You have your addressing, which that's where you will find your source and destination layer two addresses like MAC addresses. The type, which will identify what layer three protocol is in use inside of this data. And then control, if there's any, <coughs> excuse me, any quality of service, uh, differentiated control service points, anything dealing with quality of service or other items that need to be associated with the data link header in this frame. Then your data again is all that information from your upper layers. And then you have what's called a frame check sequence or your CRC, cyclical redundancy check, which is literally run against this frame and sent with the frame so that the receiving device can run the same algorithm. And if it matches, then it knows the frame wasn't damaged in transit. And then there's a frame stop. We will learn as we go through every single hop on a network. So every time that a frame goes past a router, the layer two information is completely rewritten. So you'll see here the original source, we have a destination NIC, and since this, by the way, is a remote PC, the destination MAC address would be the MAC address of router one's network interface card. So destination NIC would be R1, source NIC would be PC1 and then you see your source and destination IP address. It'll go to R1. R1 will then rewrite the layer two header for whatever technology is in use between R1 and R2. In this case, you see it's ethernet. So the source uh, NIC would now be the MAC address of R1's interface. The destination would be the MAC address of R2's interface. Source destination IP addresses have not changed. And then once you get to the final router, then you rewrite the destination and source NIC again, the MAC address is there. So at every single hop, you rewrite the layer two information for the frame so that you have the correct addressing information for that layer two uh, media or medium that you're being placed on. In WANs, it gets a little different because not all WANs need layer two information. For instance, if you're doing a point to point link, um, you really don't need a destination um, layer two address because the only other destination is on the other side of a point to point link. HDLC can also be used for point to point links. And when we get into frame relay, ATM, those can use header information. So here's all different kinds of, of WAN headers. There's a wireless frame, it comes in, it's rewritten as a PPP frame, again, rewritten as HDLC. So every time it goes through a router, may come frame relay here and then finally ethernet. But every time it goes through a router, the layer two header could change both the information in that header and maybe even the entire header type as the type of protocol in use is changed between each hop. So again, the big purpose of the data link layer is framing and error, correct, error checking at layer two. We have to worry about access control so carrier sense multiple access with collision detection, carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance. CSMACD is for bus topology lands, ethernet lands. CSMACA is for wireless lands. And then we have the older methods of token passing that we had back in the days of token ring. I hope this has been a good lecture to help you understand the data link layer and its function in our network communication processes. <clears throat>